Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, Senators Steve Swadzinski and Zach Duckworth talk about meeting the needs of students. GOP lawmakers unveil public safety and automatic refund proposals. And the Senate passes a bill to provide free meals to all Minnesota students. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. A bill to change some of Minnesota's K-12 education policies, like requiring civics and personal finance, incorporating the histories and experiences of people of color and indigenous people into the curriculum, and making schools free from hate and discrimination is headed to the Senate floor. Joining me to talk about the education policy bill is the chair of the Senate Education Policy Committee, Senator Steve Swadzinski. Thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure, Shannon. Thank you for having me. So I have to begin with congratulations, because the first time you came on this program, you were a newly elected senator, former government teacher, who had this idea about making civics a graduation requirement for 11th or 12th graders. And if this bill passes, then beginning with the 2023-24 freshman class, they will have to take a civics course in order to graduate in their 11th or 12th grade year. Why is this important? Um, well, uh... <laughs> I taught American government for 33 years, and I just assumed it was required everywhere. And when I got elected to the Minnesota Senate and found out it um, wasn't required in a lot of schools, in fact, um, of my three school districts, only um, one requires it as an upper class person to graduate. And my bill um, th doesn't allow ninth graders, uh, it's not allowed in ninth grade, it's an upper class class because I believe government shouldn't be taught in ninth grade, it should be taught in upper classes when they're signing up for selective service and they're paying their first gas taxes and they have their first jobs and they're paying income taxes and retirement plans and, and they have to start thinking about post-secondary options and all these things and that's when government should be required. And I just think it's, um, you know, the, the Article 13 of the Minnesota State Constitution begins with the wording, um, a, a Republican form form of government, civics, a Republican form of government dependent upon the intelligence of the people. It is the duty of the legislature, um, it's the only duty we have in the legislature, is to create a general and uniform system of public schools. So it's a constitutional duty that the Minnesota legislature tried to create an um, a intelligent people to help the Republican form of government progress. So that's why I think it's important. Well, another change to the graduation requirements in this bill is that students must complete a uh, personal fin I'm sorry, excuse me, a personal finance course for credit during their senior year, which goes to taxes and everything else. The bill says that the course must include topics like household budgets, loans, debt, interest, mortgages, filing taxes, and the impact of student loan debt. So with your history of experience with this age cohort, how will this information help these kids as they start their adult lives? Well, the, the, the idea for that bill came from a constituent that was, we were talking, I had their kid in class, so how's you know, Jimmy doing in class or whatever, and, um, and she said a, a couple years ago now, she said um, he was off in college and he didn't know he was supposed to get renter's insurance at this apartment complex and the basement flooded and he lost all of his stuff in this flood. And if he had known about rent, and I sat there listening to her and I thought, oh my God, why aren't we requiring personal fines to do all those things you just said and I get that the push is coming from the school boards and the administrators we can't have more mandates upon our curriculum and I would ask you to talk to your communities talk to the talk to mom and dads and because they're gonna tell you they want civics and personal finance required of, of their of, of the schools and and um, and I know you're part of this but at the state fair the 12 questions last year um, getting rid of the Social Security tax came up at 74%, yes. Um, a personal finance class and a civics class to graduate was 90%. And so people want those two classes required. Uh, let's talk about ethnic studies because the bill would add ethnic studies as a core, new core discipline. It defines ethnic studies as, quote, the critical and interdisciplinary study of race, ethnicity, and indigeneity with a focus on the experiences and perspectives of people of color within and beyond the United States. 
What does all of this mean for kids and parents? How might this new lens be incorporated? Yeah, we already have ethnic studies standards. And um, so what we've got to do a better job at is making sure they're taught. Because kids, we, um, it's just, it, uh, well, you know, 5% of our, 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 our Three percent of our teachers are teachers of color, and um, and 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 so and our students. When I first started teaching, you know, you like eighty percent were white kids, and that has changed. And we need more teachers of color in our classroom um, to reflect the changing of our, po of our of our country has changed. And to better reflect the world we live in, kids need to be exposed to all these alternative choices of all that list you just gave me and it's the right thing to do because we want us to be more welcoming and and think of the what it you know bring me your tired huddled mat i mean that we we we, we are a, a melting pot or what i prefer to call salad bowl um and so we're just an uh, we're a nation of immigrants so let's start teaching it um in our schools there is a section in the bill about malicious and sadistic conduct, which is defined as creating a hostile learning environment. And it would require that school boards now adopt a written policy that applies to students, teachers, administrators, and school personnel. What impact will this have? What is this trying to get at? Yeah, you know, there's, um, oh man, there's a lot of kids are hurting right now, and there's a lot of bullying going on. And, um, and so whatever we can do to make our kids more comfortable coming to school so that's um, a loving, welcoming environment. Our, we want our teachers to, to, to teach and we want our kids to want to learn. And when our teachers are suffering and or our kids um, because of the um, uh, malicious and salicious, is that sadistic. S malicious and sadistic behavior, um, it's just let's, we can do better and let's put it in statute so that um, kids feel safe and want to have a fun day. PSEO, or post-secondary enrollment option, is a great way for some high school kids to start college early. When I was a teacher at Century College, I almost always had one or two PSEO students in my classes. This policy bill would make one change to the PSEO program by prohibiting a college from requiring a faith statement from potential students. Why make this change? Yeah, um, that's probably the most controversial part of the bill. Um, the most discussion, the clash, so to speak, between the Republicans and Democrats, I'd say 75% of it's been on that provision in the bill. And the reason we, we um, there's a couple of schools out there that are asking faith-based questions. And um, we just, we and myself included, um, feel that uh, it's not the proper place of the, of the schools, they can they can be non they can be sectarian, um, but I don't believe they should be allowed to ask um, non sectarian. Do I have these words right? Non sect. I know what you're trying yeah. to say. Um, not not faith based questions in order to attend. Correct. And once funded. they get there, they you know they the school has the right to be able to, um, to to promote their curriculum as they see fit. But to ask students, I think it's discriminatory, and um, to ask questions that faith-based question ahead of time. Uh, Senate and House Republicans recently held a press conference where they were promoting their literacy proposal. And I've heard multiple places now that currently 50% of Minnesota children are not reading at grade level. The Republicans are proposing that some of the surplus be used to invest in what's called the science of reading, teacher training, tutoring for students who are not at grade level. Does more funding need to be allocated to help these kids uh, improve their reading skills? Do schools need to adopt different curriculum? Does money need to go in that direction? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And I think one of the things that you're going to see in the final analysis in the policy education bill and the finance education bill is a lot of money for um, reading. And, and we're we know that third graders aren't reading up to speed. We get it, and we've got all these programs and all these proposals, and we're throwing a, a lot of ideas out there, and let's figure this out. Um, one, I mean, that ranges from um, one of the bills that's in the policy bill is, um, or maybe it's in finance, uh, but that when kids go to the doctor, there's a book in their language waiting for them as they leave the doctor, and it's just a great idea. It doesn't cost a lot of money, but it encourages the parents 
parents reading to the kids, and it starts like it's a one to two year old doctor visit thing, and um, and then just as it goes on and on, and uh, we got to get these kids ready to read because if they're not reading, then they're not loving school because they they get frustrated. So we got a lot of ideas out there on reading. Okay, uh, we'll leave it there. Senator Steve Swadzinski, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. On a bipartisan vote of 38 to 26, the Senate passed a measure that will provide free breakfast and lunch to all Minnesota K-12 students. Everyone in this chamber campaigned on putting money back in the pockets of families we represent. That's what this bill will do. Look at it like a lunchbox tax cut. It gives money back to families. But let's put all that aside. Besides the healthy meals and giving money back to families, feeding kids at school is the right thing to do. Being hungry makes learning almost impossible. There is no worksheet or assignment, test or project that will matter to a student who hasn't had anything to eat. There's not a reading program or a math strategy that will improve scores if a student doesn't know where their next meal is coming from. We cannot effectively invest in our education system without ensuring all students have access to school meals. We want students focused on learning, not stressing about if there's enough money in their lunch account. There are some very real needs out there that this will help to address. And some might say that it helps a few who may not need the help. Um, but uh, actually, I'm okay with that. Uh, there are a lot of pressures on a lot of families that this will take a load off of, and so they can invest their money elsewhere. Yes, parents need relief. Moms and dads and families are being squeezed, and you're right, their food budgets are being squeezed. But I would submit to you that moms and dads know better what their kids like and what their children will eat than whatever the uniform school lunch may or may not be. Because I am a foster parent, I have children that are eligible for free lunches, I will be honest, you have to go into a porthole, you, you have to fill out all the paperwork, sometimes the portal doesn't work. I have thought about not doing the paperwork because it is onerous. There are a whole bunch of reasons people do not do this paperwork. There are, there are children who aren't even with their parents because there are children in crisis or children in need. We should not make children go hungry because of paperwork. The majority of our students are, they qualify for free or reduced lunch. It's 61% in St. Paul Public Schools, it's 51% uh, in Roseville, and we know we have a lot of lunch debt as well. The lunch debt is up to $120,000 in Roseville area schools. Um, that's just one measure of the need. Where's the level where we're going to stop picking and choosing who we're going to take care of? So it sounds to me like, uh, uh, and, and we hear all the time about a full stomach, they learn more. So if you have a student that weighs 80 pounds and a full stomach, what percent more is he going to learn than the student that weighs 180 pounds and is still very hungry. And I've heard about the formula, putting money on the formula. I've heard about issues with spot, special ed cross subsidies. I've heard about mental health. I've heard about transportation issues, bus drivers, uh, equalization, debt service, operating referendums. I've heard about needing more school counselors. I need her, I've heard about facilities maintenance, uh, compensatory damage uh, done by not filling out the forms. Uh, I've not once from my district heard about we need free lunch for all. Senator Zach Duckworth is the Assistant Minority Leader in the Senate, sits on the Senate Education Policy Committee, is a former school board member, and is taking the lead on education issues. He joins me now to talk about the importance of improving literacy and to provide his perspective on some of the Senate's education policy bill that will soon come to the floor for a vote. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. During a press conference by House and Senate Republicans, Representative Peggy Bennett said that only half of Minnesota's kids currently read at grade level. What is your perspective on how Minnesota kids are doing at reading? 
Sure. So there's an important context that we have to be mindful of when we talk about a lot of our kids and their academic progress throughout the state of Minnesota, especially our littlest kids, our kids in elementary school. And that is that they had their classroom experience disrupted for at least a couple of years during the pandemic. I'm not here to debate whether that was right or wrong or how that came about, but the reality of the situation is that we as elected officials can either rise to the occasion and help these little kids learn to read, or we can continue to do what is status quo. And what we know based on some of the literacy rates and proficiency that we've seen across the state is it's gone down. That breaks my heart. Uh, I think it is a nonpartisan issue that we want to help kids learn to read. And that's why you've seen both Senate and House Republicans come forward with this bill specifically to help increase those literacy rates across the state, help our little kids learn to read, because we know that's going to lead to their long-term academic success. Uh, the proposal put forward by Senate and House Republicans promotes what is referred to as the science of reading. What is the science of reading? The science of reading is something that is really based and founded in uh, phonics. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember hearing commercials for Hooked on Phonics all the time. I can't remember the last time I heard one of those. Uh, but it has to do with the understanding that it has been proven scientifically that teaching kids how to sound out letters and the combination of letters and decode words is what sets them up for success in terms of literacy, learning how to read. Um, there's a podcast out there I'd recommend people potentially listen to called Soul the Story. I heard it. Very I watched good. and listened to the Did whole you? thing. It was, yeah. it was very good. It is. Well, it, it's it's eye-opening and it gives some of the historical context that explains because when I say to people, we need to teach our kid to, kids to sound out words, they look at me like, well, of course, isn't that what we're doing? Well, there was a movement many years ago to actually switch and change how kids are being taught to read. The thought was much like how kids learn to talk. Well, if we simply immerse them in, in words and books, th they'll just pick it up naturally. Or the science of reading has shown it doesn't work that way. We need to have the, the phonics approach to teaching kids how to read. That's what is successful, not simply just providing them a, a bunch of books and hoping they absorb it. So that's why this program is very specific and says the state of Minnesota uh, in conjunction with our districts and parents is going to double down on what we know is to be the proven method of helping kids learn to read. The details of the plan uh, include increasing, no, I'm sorry, creating a special revenue fund so that school districts that want to have the funding to incorporate new reading curriculum, instructional materials, books, and funding for teacher training because curriculum is very expensive. How much money would be needed to retool Minnesota schools and teachers to move in this direction? So the, the, the bill calls for setting aside $250 million specifically for the Reading Reset Program to provide the critical relief we need, we, the, the districts and kids need. Uh, obviously we're hoping that makes a significant uh, dent or change to what we're experiencing across the state. And if it's going to require more, uh, helping our kids learn to read is a worthwhile investment. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, uh, and parents don't care either, quite frankly, when it comes to helping their kids succeed in the classroom. So if that's not enough to get the job done, but we are seeing progress, we will continue to make those investments in our kids. Um, that's, that's really what the, the, the whole basis and idea of the program is. And the, the, the approach is less top-down. The state's not going to tell you exactly how to go about this. What we're going to tell you is use science of reading, ask us for the funding and we'll get it to you because no one knows better how to help these kids than the teachers in the classroom that are familiar with them that know what works and what doesn't with these kids in combination with their parents this should be a let's give the resources to the districts and the teachers who need it and are asking for it and allow them to work in conjunction with parents on helping our kids succeed the senate dfl's education policy bill is next headed to the floor it primarily includes proposals from the Department of Education and from the Senate DFL. Among the proposals that members of the Republican caucus have objected to is one that would prevent colleges from requiring a faith statement for potential PSEO or post-secondary enrollment option students. Those are students who are in high school but seeking to take some college courses on the college campus. What is your view? Well, here's what I could tell you about PSEO. Um, in stemming back from even when I was a student, let alone my time on the school board, it is a well-regarded program that people see as a, a fundamental uh, advantage to many public school kids across the state. When we talk about helping kids make college affordable, when we talk about helping kids and families reduce their student loan debt or burden, 
PSEO has been a, a golden opportunity for kids to get ahead and, and do those things. And so uh, our issue with the bill is, and, and the restriction on PSEO is, if we're gonna limit those opportunities for students, we don't see that as a win. And quite frankly, neither do they. Uh, in all aspects of that bill, the thing I've heard the most about, there are two things I've heard, but the thing I've heard the most about is parents and students are very upset that we would potentially be reducing PSEO options for kids. Uh, I've heard countless stories from people saying PSEO is the reason why I was able to go on to higher education. It saved me money. It was a great experience. Uh, and I have not heard anybody in my time working in education say that they had any issues with PSEO. So quite frankly, I don't know where this, this part of the bill is coming from. Uh, but I do know it's got people upset because they see it going to limit the options of people. If for some reason you're a student applying to a, a higher institution and you don't like that aspect of their enrollment process, well then maybe perhaps there's another PSEO option you can take advantage of that does suit your needs better. But the fact that we would simply eliminate some options altogether for students, that's not a win-win for anybody. Another change is the requirement that 11th or 12th graders will take one credit in civics and that 12th graders will take one credit in financial literacy in order to graduate. You are a lawmaker, you are also a small business owner, so I would think that these changes make sense to you. Yeah, so there, you know, and, and I kind of jokingly uh, admit to, you know, we typically say, well, we don't want to mandate anything or make any changes in our schools, and then I'll kind of sheepishly say, except for, you know, financial literacy or civics, right? Uh, here's the deal. I've been a member of the Minnesota Army National Guard for 18 years as of this month. Uh, our kids knowing about their civic duties and responsibilities and what it means to be American and what it means to be Minnesotan, I think is one of the most important things we should be teaching in our public schools. I certainly learned it as a student, uh, not just in the classroom but at home. And we have to make sure that kids are graduating from high school, knowing and understanding that. As far as personal or financial literacy goes, uh, a lot of parents have come forward and said this needs to be a part of what we're teaching kids and a lot of kids after they've gone on you know and become adults have said I wish I would have learned some of this in high school so whether it's a dedicated class an elective part of you know econ whatever we're asking districts to make sure that when it comes to civics and when it comes to financial literacy we're giving our kids the tools they're going to need to be successful not just up until the day they graduate but beyond and in life uh, one more thing, another aspect of the bill that perhaps not all will agree with is the incorporation of ethnic studies into public school curriculum. The provided definition is, quote, the critical and interdisciplinary study of race, ethnicity, and indigeneity with a focus on the experiences and perspectives of people of color within and beyond the United States, end quote. I recall that you mentioned in committee that you have a diverse background, but what is your perspective on this aspect? Sure. Um, well, as it relates to my background, um, my great-grandfather was born in Mexico, immigrated to the United States. Uh, my great-grandmother was also of Mexico. Uh, it was a last name like Duckworth, and maybe based on my appearance, you might not guess I have uh, quite a diverse family, but I do. Uh, my grandfather also went on to uh, serve the United States uh, during World War II under General Patton. And many of the things I learned from him and other family members uh, have to do with you know, treating people with respect, has to do with equality, has to do with tolerance, uh, valuing diversity, all the things that as Minnesotans and Americans we do. And those are things that are being taught in school. When you look at how the, uh, the de when you look at the definition of ethnic studies or ethnic studies curriculum, there's a little bit more to the definition than you just shared. And there are other things that get defined within that definition that some people, when they look at it, begin to say, are we taking a step away from academic instruction and beginning to potentially talk more about politics or a certain political ideology. And that's where the rub is. Number one, it's a curriculum mandate that would be pervasive from K, from kindergarten all through 12th grade. And some instances are saying that, that every single subject matter needs to be taught through that lens. And I think that's where some people begin to challenge the academic aspect of it. Uh, and then, you know, we've got teachers out there who are saying, you keep filling our plates with so many things and now you're just adding even more to it. We need to focus on the traditional academic standards and instruction our kids need. And let's do that first before we, we begin to add more. Senator Zach D Duckworth, I want to thank you so much for your time. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Jeremy Miller unveiled a bill that would automatically return surpluses to taxpayers. The Minnesota Refund Program incorporates ideas 
that the Democrats had for a one-time rebate check. It incorporates ideas that Republicans had for permanent ongoing tax relief. But instead of wasting time by bickering back and forth on who has the best idea, this puts a program in place to ensure taxpayers get their money back when the state has a massive budget surplus. And Senate and House Republicans unveiled a package of public safety proposals. What we're looking at today is a series of policies that I think will move Minnesota closer to a better state for our families and for our communities to be. Other proposals are increasing penalties for fleeing police officers in a motorized chase, addressing overdose deaths involving fentanyl-laced illegal drugs establishing the same weight thresholds and penalties for sale as we, as we currently apply to heroin. We, increase, uh, we want to increase sworn officers on metro transit lines in the metropolitan area. Uh, rape kit processing has actually started out as a bipartisan effort this year, uh, continuing the work that we started in the Republican majority of last term. We also uh, are ensuring a follow-up to remove firearms from those who have domestic abuse backgrounds uh, that have been given ordered or ordered by a judge, but no action uh, historically follows. We want to make sure action follows in that regard. We also will be giving a grant to Ramsey County Sheriff for coordinating a VSET, that's a violent crime enforcement um, uh, team as well as the state patrol for their air patrol, their helicopter, which is vitally needed in the crime of car chases. Right now, uh, all the elements of carjacking are in a robbery. Uh, many times we've seen, especially in the metro areas where they are so prevalent, that the crime is being charged out as a theft. We're not changing any of the penalties associated with the robbery, but we are making it so it can't be charged as a theft and then not be considered a crime of violence, which I think we can all agree that um, being drug out of your car, uh, either at, by a strong armed robbery or at, as an armed robbery, is a crime of violence, and it should be treated that way. Who's actually posted bail? We've seen so many scenarios where we've got uh, organizations that posted bail, and specifically one of them. You look at the continued challenges of the Minnesota Freedom Fund. Um, I had carried a bill to, to uh, get them to comply if they're going to be a bail bonds company to act in, under the same policies. But this bill, part of our package, makes sure it's clear and transparent who's posting the bail so we can understand what the contributing factors are to crime. Perhaps most importantly, these bills will actually do something to stop the crime with tougher penalties, longer sentences for repeat violent offenders who just simply will not obey the law. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.